Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the Naval War College Foundation's first Newport Lecture Series presentation of the 2022 to 2023 academic year, Fighting the Fleet, Operational Art in Modern Fleet Combat, which is the title of a book authored by your guest speakers tonight and published last December. It has become quite popular and has yielded many positive reviews, including this one from Admiral Jim Hogg. Captains Cares and Cowden build on a computational understanding of past professionals to move operational concepts of naval warfare well beyond the current thinking. The chapter on op art in future combat shows how a truly distributed fleet should fight, a remarkable effort and highly relevant book. And this one from Admiral Jim Stavridis. As the US Navy returns to great power competition amid rapid change in maritime technology, Captains Cares and Cowden provide an important reset to the theory behind fleet employment. This book drives home the enduring truth that even with tremendous uh, technological uh, advantages, navies still fight like navies, a must read for every naval strategist. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm George Lang, CEO of the Naval War College Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to our special speaker series. I also wish to thank Chairman Bilden, our esteemed board of trustees, members, friends, and sponsors, as well as my staff for their incredible support and commitment for the rewarding missions, the Naval War College and Naval War College Foundation. Enabled by our generous members, including many of you, the Naval War College has been able to continue its innovative, cutting edge education and research, scholarship and wargaming programs and activities, and much more that have sustained it as America's premier institution and standard bearer for professional military education. The Naval War College Foundation <clears throat> to supporting the U.S. Naval War College and its mission to deliver excellence in education and research and remain steadfast in providing the critical resources needed to advance its priorities of research and scholarship, curriculum and instruction, endowed chairs, capital improvements, faculty and student academic achievement awards, conferences and symposia, and reg regional and national studies. Tonight's presentation by three Naval War College alumni is an example of the critical and strategic thinking that college faculty encourage during the 10-month academic year. Many leaders in our operating forces today who studied at the college are either in residence or as a non-resident college of distance education student hone their operational and strategic level of war skills at this great institution, including the following notable flag officers and distinguished civilian executives. Admiral Mike Rogers, USN, retired former commander, U.S. Cyber Command and Director, National Security Agency. General David Rodriguez, U.S. Army retired, former commander, U.S. Africa Command. Dr. Clifford Stanley, Major General, United States Military, I'm sorry, United States Marine Corps, retired, Undersecretary of Defense, Personnel and Readiness. And Admiral Robert Papp, Jr., U.S. Coast Guard, retired, former Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Before we proceed, as a matter of protocol, should you have a question come to you during the presentation, please submit it via the Q&A box versus the chat box. I'll be happy to present it to our guest speakers during the Q&A session. We plan to address as many of your questions as time permits tonight. Since 2020, we've been bringing Newport Lecture Series presentations and many other events hosted by the foundation to you virtually. Uh, while we are now hosting in-person events again, thankfully, we recognize the opportunities presented by operating in a virtual environment to connect with members around the globe. So we will continue this series, for the most part, remotely or a hybrid or, or mix of uh, in-person and remote um, venues. <clears throat> now, to introduce and welcome you distinguished guest speakers for tonight's presentation. Captain Jeff Cares, United States Navy, retired as the CEO of Allendade Incorporated. He is a thought leader in information age military innovation, consults at the most senior levels of the International Defense Study, and lectures internationally and at service colleges on the future of combat. <clears throat> Harvard Business Review selected Jeff's research to the top 20 list of breakthrough ideas for 2006, and he has been featured in such information age bellwethers as uh, Wired and Fast Company. In addition to fighting the fleet, Operational Art and Modern Fleet Combat, and Jeff is the author of Distributed Network Operations, The Fundamentals of Network-Centric Warfare and Operations Research for Unmanned Systems, in addition to pioneering work in the application of complex systems research to military problems. Jeff also moderates the uh, Allidate Online Discussion, a popular military innovation forum. He is a uh, combat veteran of the first Gulf War, whose military career has included multiple command tours, operational roles with every numbered fleet staff, including U.S. 10th Fleet 
and more than a decade of, decade of service on four uh, star stabs. Captain Tony Cowden was a commission in 1984 through the University of Michigan uh, Naval ROTC program and subsequently qualified as a surface warfare officer. In 1989, he left active duty and affiliated with the Naval Reserve. As a reservist, he commanded Navy Reserve FMG Support Unit 1, served as OIC of Navy Reserve U.S. Fleet Forces Joint Task Force 700. He was recalled to active duty in November 2001 for two years to serve as Navy liaison to the Joint Staff and Battle Watch Captain Naval Operations Center in support of Operations Noble Eagle, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. In April 2009, Captain Cowden returned to active duty component and was assigned to be uh, the Chief Naval Forces Division U.S. Military Training Mission, Riyadh Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Since then, he attended Naval War College as a student in the College of Naval Warfare um, and as a Gravely Scholar, served as Assistant and then Deputy Chief of Staff for Theater Security Cooperation, Com 7 Fleet, returned to the Naval War College as military faculty, teaching national security affairs and co-teaching electives in how navies fight and win at sea in Southeast Asia security and was a member of the Royal College of Defense Studies, London, England. He is a designated Naval strategist and joint qualified officer. After military service, Captain Cowden formed his own consulting company, Starry Consulting Services, LLC, and was elected to the board of directors for the Naval Sea Cadet Corps. The forward of the book was drafted by Admiral Scott Thrift, former Pacific Fleet Commander, who served in the US Navy for more than 40 years, rising from his commission through the Aviation Reserve Office of Canada program to become a Navy light attack and strike fighter pilot. He commanded at all levels, including FA-18 weapons, aircraft carrier based on squadrons, carrier air wing, carrier strike group, and the US 7th Fleet forward deployed to Japan, finally completing his uniform career as the 35th commander of the US Pacific Fleet. During his years of service, he participated in combat operations, praying mantis, Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. As founder of the SWIFT Group LLC, previous MIT Center for International Studies Robert E. Wilhelm Fellow, MIT Research Affiliate, a senior fellow at the Center for Naval Analysis, an adjunct professor at the Naval War College, U.S. Naval Institute board member, and Spirit of America Advisory board member, Admiral Swift continues to explore opportunities to serve where his interests, abilities, experience, and national need align. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to your expert guest speakers tonight, Captains Jeff Cares and Tony Cowden and Admiral Scott Swift. Jeff? Over to you, Jeff. Oh, thank you very much. So we are, Tony and I are pleased to, uh, to talk to you tonight. Let me uh, share my screen here so we can start with the slides. I can't talk and work all the buttons at the same time sometimes. So our, our book is called Fighting the Fleet, um, Operational Art and Modern Fleet Combat. And one of the um, reasons that um, we, we, we focused on this topic was some of what we perceived as an, an over-reliance on joint doctrine to tell us how we ought to be fighting. Um, some people have misunderstood um, what the book is about. Um, we talk about fleets fighting fleets, not fleets doing land attack act actions or the, some of the uh, power projection roles where the, the fleet is providing strikes over land. That, that's a, um, a very different animal than what we're talking about, peer fleet, fleets fighting peer fleets. And, and so we go into the, um, in the book, we go into some of the, the history um, and some of the, the, the concepts over time about what those have been. But I think one of the, uh, the main motivations of uh, for writing the book um, is this quote from Rear Admiral Bradley Fisk. Actually, he wrote it when he was commander um, in his uh, Naval Institute Prize winning essay from 1905. Um, and and in, that, um, in that article, he talks about admiralship and, and what it is and what, um, and, and I'll let you read the quote and, and I'll, I'll voice over while you do because one of the challenges we have is that when we focus too much on joint doctrine, uh, we're often te teaching generalship. And, and not only that, it's not that we're teaching future admirals at the War College, we're also teaching the admiral staff. And so when we hear admiralship or even generalship, um, you know, the, the command organization at that level is really the staff um, planners and the decision-making apparatus that supports the principle. So 
when we hear about admiralship, we're not just talking about those things that run through a senior flag officer's um, calculus as, as he or she is looking at the operational challenge in front of them, but also all the efforts up to that point um, that the staff makes to help shape that decision for the decision maker. And so um, the, the punchline here is just as um, handling fleets are so different from handling armies, so we ought to expect that admiralship will be very different from generalship. Um, and and it, it is still unfortunate that we don't have such a word as admiralship. Uh, we, uh, you know, humbly um, have put forth some of the notions in the book um, as, as, as a start towards helping develop this thing called, called admiralship. Um, so rather than um, regurgitate the entire contents of the book for you and try to bring you through chapter and verse of everything we talk about, uh, what Tony and I have decided to do is just hit some of the high thematic points and, and talk in general about um, some, some, uh, some of the main thrusts of the book and then talk about what we have come to believe of, of some of the implications of, of what's in the book uh, because some of those are somewhat controversial, uh, if not anathema to, to some of the ways that we are, have been thinking in the current fleet about how we might fight in the very near future. And we, we just ask that people um, take a look at some of those and, and, and help to answer some of the questions perhaps, perhaps that we pose, or we'd be happy to be wrong in some of the things that we think are, are challenges. Um, but I, I think they, they deserve frank debate. Um, and, and so uh, let me go into what some of those, um, uh, some of the uh, main thrusts are. So if a fleet is gonna fight against another fleet, um, we need to know what the major muscle movements of fleets are. Um, in the joint doctrine and in, in joint planning process and in the joint staffing process, um, which has been adopted by a lot of the Navy planning process, they talk about the joint functions, information, intelligence, virus, maneuver, movement, sustainment, and protection. What's very different about naval forces is that we don't do these um, in, in isolation. For example, in, in joint warfare, um, and particularly in ground warfare, uh, you typically have fires and movement or fires and maneuver rather uh, as being kind of symbiotic and supporting each other. You lay down fires so that you can execute some maneuver. And then once you get the maneuver done, you can lay down other fires so that you can conduct other maneuvers and the, and the two go hand in hand, but they're done by different forces. Uh, naval forces in particular do fires and maneuver at the same time and all the different platforms um, do all those types of functions together and they um, do a higher level function while they're trying to do that. And we talk about the four main functions of fleets being striking, scouting, screening, and basing. Um, and, and you can go back to uh, Bradley Fisk um, and, and you can go back to Corbett and you can see how some of those, uh, the vestiges of some of those are all there, but four modern fleets in the machine age up until the missile age and in the information age, those four basic functions are still, um, are, are still very important um, to, to how fleets fight other fleets, how admirals fight other admirals and the competition between fleets. So, uh, so much of what we do in the modern Navy is focused on new technologies and, and, and new capabilities. Um, what we are urging is that people don't miss the fact that these are competitions and in some ways the competitions haven't changed we just have a new toolbox and, and new new ways of doing it, um, but we have to understand what these um, these very traditional um, but but rational ways of looking at the major fleet functions are to see how they go together in modern fleet combat. So to understand strike, for example, um, one has to understand the salvo equations, and so we have a whole chapter talking about how the salvo equations work, how fleet planners should use the salvo equations what they imply about salvo sizes and the battle of the first salvo, um, what they might imply about the battle of subsequent salvos, um, and also some of the challenges that, um, that you see when you have an interaction of offensive combat power, which are the missiles you shoot, defensive combat power, which, are the, which is the defensive actions that the opposing fleet has against your salvo, and staying power, which is the, uh, the amount of combat power that the a force that you're fighting against can absorb. And there are some really complicated interactions 
um, that, that planners need to understand and that senior officers need to understand when they take a force to go into battle to conduct um, a strike. And so we, are, we put a whole chapter in about those equations and how to think about them, but also we include an appendix on how you would actually use them as part of the Navy planning pro process. Uh, currently, if you look at the Navy planning um, guidance in NWP-5, um, it has a, an appendix where you're supposed to do a relative combat power assessment. And it frankly says in there that there is no, there are no mathematics to tell you how to do this. Um, well, that's patently not true. Uh, there are mathematics on how to do this. They're called the Salvo equations. And so we show exactly how, how a fleet planner would do a relative combat power assessment using the Salvo equations and some other things in the joint planning process in the uh, mock uh, as, a, as, a, as a fleet planner. Um, an, another example is um, the scouting function. Uh, we draw a, a pretty strong distinction between searching and surveillance. Uh, one of the things that we've, um, I think, come to believe corporately in the Navy is that uh, there's this overall function called ISR um, and that uh, our, our sensors are like vacuums that pick up pieces of data and send them to a central repository where we can combine all the pieces of data and then tell the forces what to go out and shoot at. Um, particularly when it's a fleet versus a fleet and you have a great uncertainty about uh, position and location of the adversary fleet in contrast to how we might have uh, uh, a better idea of where land-based targets are with, with uh, classic strike operations. Um, <clears throat> the, the way that we go out and we do either surveillance uh, or search um, matters. And the information conditions between those two, um, fleet planners need to understand what is different about a surveillance problem and what's different about a search problem. And so we well, one of the reasons why scouting is a major function of a fleet is because the information process that a scouting force done is a search process. Definitely different in information theory than a surveillance process, which is what a screening force does. And so although they may use the same types of platforms, when they go out to gather their information, um, a search is more like detective work, where surveillance is more like a stakeout to use a law enforcement analogy. And so we have forces that do scouting that go out to find the thing that we might strike against. And we have forces that screen, which may blunt the strike of the adversary trying to hit our main body. And so um, that's why those two functions are separated and different. Um, and, and that's why there are different functions of the force. Uh, what's I think really neglected in how we think about how navies fight is the basing function. Um, if you do not have um, an operational logistics capability, then all you have is tactical maneuver. Because unless you can refuel in order to maneuver at operational, at the operational level of war, you'll be severely logistics limited and you won't be able to continue the fight. One of the things that's um, unique about naval forces is that could, they could be a thousand miles away yesterday Today they come in and they'll have a fight and they can be a thousand miles away again tomorrow. Winston Churchill has this great quote that's saying the fundamental difference between land forces and Navy forces is that with a land force, once you make contact, you're either fighting today or you're fighting tomorrow. And if you're not ready today, you better dig in because the fight's gonna happen tomorrow. With Naval forces, if it doesn't happen today, both forces will probably break off and it won't happen for weeks. And so this, this dramatic fluidity and, and ability to disperse to the, to the wide oceans and then come in with a density of fires and a density of forces and combat power is a characteristic of naval maneuver and naval operational schema maneuver that is fundamentally different than how we typically think about it in a, in a joint um, environment. What's most important, and we, we stress this really strongly in the, in the, um, in the book, is that the salvo equations tell you that you must shoot as much as you can in your first salvo when you finally are ready to engage. You should not hold any forces in reserve. Uh, the math just doesn't support doing that because there is such great uncertainty in exchanges of missile fires. Even in the age of, of precision weapons um, and precision sensors, there still is a great deal of wasted interaction. It's called uh, combat entropy and we talk about it um, in great detail in the, in the second chapter. Um, <clears throat> what we note, though, is that if you, um, if you have shot all your weapons 
um, in the first salvo, the way you get other forces into the fight in the naval sense, it's not that you hold forces in reserve like you do in the army. They're always trying to figure out where the operational reserve forces are so they can be committed at the culminating point to influence the battle space. What you can do with navies with, um, with the right kind of operational logistics, your operational reserve is in logistics. You rearm your ships, you rearm your missile magazines, and you get into the fight for the second salvo. Um, and again, um, what happens after the first salvo is, is that typically one force or the other tries to break away because they've had the worst of it. And so being able to pursue and follow up for the second salvo is one of the big challenges. Certainly, uh, you saw it in uh, Midway and Lake Tay Gulf in World War II. But if we get into big fleet missile combat uh, in the future, um, being able to follow up that first salvo with the second salvo um, was very will be key to to prevailing in a more at more strategic levels, being able to eliminate the enemy's fleet, for example, and those types of things. So that we put a great uh, emphasis on uh, the operational reserve being in logistics. Um, and, and so we talk uh, a great deal in the chapter on control about the notion of admiralship and how admirals and their staffs need to control the pace of these four functions um, in almost a rock, paper, scissors type competition with an adversary. Um, it's very difficult to do the classic Mahanian large force on large force unless you have a predominance of combat power. If you do have that predominance of combat power, then you have to worry about inferior fleet, superior fleet calculus, and the inferior fleet will not want to join um, in that battle. And, and there are plenty of historical cases where uh, Corbett calls it the paradox of the arrested offense. You have all this combat power, and you don't get to d use it because the adversary won't, won't take you on. And so the inferior fleet is always looking to find ways that they can um, use uh, what, what Churchill called equalizing tactics, try to limit, your, try to pick up pieces of your force until perhaps two, the forces are more equal and they can have a more fair fight. And of course, the superior fleet is always trying to have the unfair fight. So there's always this, uh, this bait and switch, um, rock, paper, scissors type competition between the two fleet commanders about which forces to offer and, and how to bring them to bear. Um, you, you typically would not see that if there were perfectly equal forces, but having perfectly equal forces is pretty rare. Normally one person, one side has is, is got some kind of disadvantage than the other. And so they're trying to limit their weakness and exploit their strength while you're trying to blunt their strength and exploit their weakness. And, and again, we talk about the competition rather than the technology and what are the different types of game theoretic ways of thinking about uh, the competition. And we, um, we conclude with a chapter on, on what this means for future forces. Um, uh, lately, and, and I'm out here in Monterey at the Naval Postgraduate School at a uh, conference out here, and uh, we've been talking an awful lot about this idea that, uh, that dogs should fight dogs and bears should fight bears. And as we start to uh, take our force and distribute it, and we think we're going to have a lot of unmanned vehicles out in the battle space. Um, we need to make sure that the bear, the, the large parts of the fleet, the large elements of the fleet keep their focus on destroying the large elements of the opposing fleet um, and don't get distracted by the dogs. Uh, because certainly a lot of dogs can take down a bear. One dog can't. And if, you, if you're up against some dogs and you're a bear, you better have your own dogs to fight those dogs so that you can focus on the bear fighting the bear. Um, and and I, I know it's, a, uh, it's an imperfect analogy, but I think it, it shows a little bit about um, the classic functions of the smaller parts, uh, what Wayne Hughes used to call the flotilla fleet, the flotilla parts of the fleet. Um, certainly um, in the Royal Navy and in the US Navy, the role of destroyers and small submarines had that dog function while the main elements of the battle force, the striking parts of the battle force in particular, were the bears that would go after the other bears. Um, so uh, from where we've gone in the book and what we talked about um, with the striking, scouting, uh, screening, and basing, the inferior fleet, superior fleet, um, the idea of the, the, the um, controlling the flow in, in kind of a game theoretic way of, of how to make those decisions and how to take a strategy which is flexible enough to respond to um, 
to unfolding events in the battle space in some ways has having a decentralized uh, execution. Um, we, we have some kind of bumper stickers or, um, or, or um, major implications as we see them. If, if what we say in the book is true, then I think, then we think there are some things that we need to uh, correct about where our fleet is going and how combat may be um, occurring in the future. Um, so the first one is that technology alone is insufficient. We spend an inordinate amount of time talking about the vehicles. Um, we, we talk in the book a little bit about the molecule, the bit, and the staff. Um, so molecules are the, the platforms we have. Uh, bits are certainly pieces of information or radar returns, anything that we have that flows around the battle space. Molecules go at, at molecule speed. Um, bits go at, at light speed. And staffs, the people, the cognitive part of it, they go at staff speed. And sometimes they only meet for decision twice a day. Or sometimes um, a particular part of cognitive part of the fleet has a 24 hour ordeal that they have to think their way through. Um, and so understanding the mismatch between molecule speed, bit speed, and staff speed is important. Uh, recognizing that when we talk about technology, many times we are only talking about the, the bit part of it. What are we building into the ships? And when we talk about the, uh, I'm sorry, the molecule part of it, what are we building into the platforms? And we, when we talk about the bit part of it, uh, we have a kind of a shallow idea that we will centrally collect, collect all the information and, and we'll send it out where it's needed with this very elegant battle network. Um, that has some challenges, not only because it doesn't satisfy where the cognition is. And usually the information that's relative to the right scale and the force is at the level of, of that cognitive operator. And it could be at the 04, 05 level rather than at the 07, 08 level. And the good part of admiralship is also knowing what part of the fight they should not be in and recognizing what their scope and their scale is so that they can let other elements go do what they do best and fight at their finer scale. Uh, another implication is that we, uh, we think the fleet is undergunned and that doesn't necessarily mean that we need better missiles or more missiles. Um, the salvo equations tell you that if you just show up with um, twice as many hulls, what you've done is you've split the enemy's magazines in half. And there's this interrelation between missile inventories and targets that can be managed without necessarily building more technologies into offensive or defensive missiles. And so we think that that whole um, competition between fleets needs to be re-examined, not just from a technologist perspective, can I shoot down a particular missile with a particular um, defensive system, but what the full implications of the salvo equations are for the size of the fleet, the size of the vehicles, the number of hits that each can take, the number of defensive shots that they can take, and the size of the magazines that we use for our, our own offensive efforts, and the mix between offense and defense in the magazines that we have. It's a very complicated issue. Um, and, and it's not helped by the fact that it's very difficult um, to, to reload some of our systems forward, although I know that there's been efforts to work on that, uh, and some of our um, less capable systems can be reloaded forward, but that whole point about operational logistics is built into this, um, the operational reserve being in logistics is built into this, and it needs to be part of that calculus as well. How do you get those missiles refilled so that if, instead of having two um, Aegis destroyers, I can expend one, refill it, and I have another one. Um, it's just the same hull number, but it's a new magazine full of missiles that I can use again. And that's what's great about a fleet that's very different than regeneration of ground forces. Uh, the other thing that we, uh, we, uh, we've discussed a lot, and it raises a lot of questions, is this idea that um, we, we kind of have a, um, a luxury fleet if you will. Uh, we have DDGs, which are really cruisers, and it's most of our fleet, and the cruisers are cruisers, and so we have these big platforms, and what we're really missing is, is what we call the good five cent cigar, uh, a, a relatively inexpensive but capable enough um, small combatant that can handle the dogfight rather than the bear fight, and if you look at the history of naval combat, and you look at the history of police time planning, you find that over and over again what, what we've done um, in the West in particular, is we have um, 
we've built the high-end platforms and we focus on the technology of the high-end platforms. And when we go to war, we plan it because we don't have enough destroyers and we can't put them in places that we never envisioned them being before because they, they weren't um, foreseen some of the roles that we'd have. Um, you, you look at the opening days of World War II and, and about 20% of the Royal Navy was down in the South Atlantic trying to chase down commerce raiders. And they had to send cruisers down to do that because they didn't have destroyers, which probably would be a good platform to do that with. And, and they had to take 20% of the, the fleet that was supposed to be guarding the homeland and send it down to the South Atlantic at a time when they could have afford to do that. And, and, and again, if it weren't for the um, for um, Lend-Lease, they, they, when they, they would get their destroyers when they really needed them. If not for that, it would have been a really tough road to hoe for the, the Royal Navy in the first years of, of World War II. Um, so anyway, we, we need this, um, this small size platform, not a micro size like the UAVs and the USVs, unmanned surface vehicles, unmanned um, undersea vehicles and unmanned air vehicles that people talk about, but something on the order of a 15 or 2000 ton destroyer, something even smaller than the LCS that, that we've come out with lately. Uh, and the last point is that uh, we have a lot of clouds and lightning bolts and hand waving in a lot of our doctrine. Um, and when you look at the mathematics behind how fleets fight, um, there's really a lot that's unrealistic about it. Part of it is um, it's, it's a vestige of how we buy things in capabilities-based analysis. We use um, the um, model-based systems integration, which starts with clouds and lightning bolts. Capability-based analysis is what, and capabilities-based acquisition is what makes you keep building destroyers until they weigh 20,000 tons. You keep putting more and more and more capability on it because you're measuring capability. You're not measuring how the fleet as a whole fights, which is really what fleet, what, what Admiral Fisk was talking about in his uh, Navy as a fighting machine. So we, as a kind of uh, underscoring all these points, uh, we think the Navy Pentagon needs to return to threat-based analysis, which we got away from in the early 90s when we no longer had a specified threat now that we know more about what our threats are in the world and we have to worry more about uh, peer adversaries, uh, returning to threat-based analysis, I think would give us a clearer idea of how to solve what we see as some of the implications of, of, of combat in the future. So I think that's a good um, overview of, of what we talk about in the book and, and what, our, um, what our opinions are coming out of writing it. And uh, from here, uh, that concludes my part of uh, this discussion. And, and I'll hand it back to you, George. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, excellent points. Uh, very interesting material. So uh, I, I see a couple of questions are already popping in, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, wait to answer. Uh, I think we give Tony a shot and Admiral Swift uh, for remarks. So Tony, over to you, sir. Um, well, I'm itching to get at the questions, George. I'll, I'll pass for any additional remarks. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, Admiral Swift, anything, sir? <laughs> All right, George. Uh, the, yeah, I, I would like to say a couple of things. And I, I, uh, the reason I want to say this now is, is I think Jeff and Tony can, can best carry the water forward in answering the majority of the questions, having done this a couple of times before. But I think it's worthwhile to, to pause for a minute and explain a little bit um, why I was a strong supporter for the concept of this book, and then welcome the opportunity at Jeff and Tony's invitation um, to provide a forward. And in that forward, I tried to shape why I think this book is important in the context of the experience and learning um, that occurred in that transition that I went through from 06 to 07. Uh, first as a deputy commander of Naval Forces Central Command, um, then as a strike group commander, and then as a J3 at uh, PACOM. Uh, Seventh Fleet, and then uh, eventually Pack Fleet. And I, prior to that, I spoke about um, that experience. As an 06, I would speak about uh, my experience in, in really coming out of the War College uh, of that period of transition that is critically important, transition opportunities uh, at the 05, 06, 07 level. And I, I think that in an ideal uh, situation, we would um, 
expose O5s to the operational level of war in a, in a structured way at one of the war colleges, my bias view. For those of us in, in, uh, in the Navy, it's at the Naval War College. And for the reasons I think that Jeff uh, uh, stressed um, so well, the, the unique nature of, of warfare in, in the maritime domain. I would include the Marines of that, but it is, you know, the Marines, they, they are certainly now with the ABO concept and um, the, the direction that the Commandant is taking them in, uh, project power into the Navy domain. Um, but I, th I think they're getting back to their roots in the littorals and, and the power that they do project ashore is in the, uh, is in the littorals. But nonetheless, I think that fighting space and the dynamics of it are different than they are than what the rest of the joint force fights in. We could argue about Air Force contribution in the maritime domain, but um, while they're focused on understanding it, uh, frankly, I think this book would be helpful in, in um, accelerating the rate that they're coming to grips with how to apply Air Force air power in that uh, domain. It's very, it is so dynamic, as Jeff pointed out, it's a very different uh, problem set than um, if, if you're really designed as a force to support uh, ground maneuver units, um, uh, mostly, uh, mostly Army. Um, and so you start in that transition in an educated way as an 05. I, I, so as a 06, I, I think um, you're exposed to it as an 05. I think, I think as an 06, uh, you're really trained to it. You know, that's where, you know, that's where major commanders are. That's where uh, air wing commanders are. That's where air defense commanders are. That's where uh, uh, Deseron commanders are. Um, so, and, and then the, the last transition, I think, is to the 07 level, where um, 07 strike group commanders in particular are tested to the art of war. And we don't do that. When, when I came back as the PAC fleet commander, I was told, oh, what do you see the training process and JTFX and COM2X? It's completely changed. Um, we, we test the, uh, the strike group commanders at the operational level of war. And I said, oh, so uh, we don't have MOEs anymore. It, we allow free play. Oh, no, no, no. We still have to go to certification. We'll stop. If you're doing a certification process, that's different than war fighting. And, and I saw the opportunity in writing to the, the forward to this book uh, to make that case. Um, I had a series of notes that I actually wrote down prior to Jeff's comments, but you're going to see an awful lot of overlap here. So my concern is that as you get more senior um, at the 07, 08, 09 level, it almost all becomes art. It's all the sub subjective assessment that occurs. Jeff top, uh, talked about this, about how we should fight a fleet or how we should fight a force. Um, and we, we have lost that science piece of it that's so critical. So the salvo equations that Jeff and, and Tony have um, explained in the book, highlighted in the book, they're important not just for the, the mathematical equations themselves that give you a sen sense of what's necessary um, to succeed in an exchange. As you go through it and deeply understand the process, you have a better understanding of the science of war fighting as well. And my fear is, is that we've moved away from the science of war fighting um, in, in uh, executing at the operational level of war. It's almost all art. It, it's all subjective. Um, I think rarely as a, as a uh, PAC fleet commander did I have a true fact-based discussion about COAs and how we arrived at them. It, it was really the intuition and the experience of, of the staff that was bringing these COAs up. And when you start to pick at those, they would start to come apart in the details uh, because they weren't built on that uh, foundation of, uh, of math. So if you're without that math, if you're talking about scope and scale, I think you're talking about um, best guess. Uh, Jeff talked about having a naval reserve and you know, rarely do I have, a, do I, in my experience, had, did we have a reverse a reserve force? We just didn't have the assets for it. And then the concerns are with uh, uh, logistics being that reserve force, the ability to rearm, 
you know, this idea of we spent an awful lot of time at PAC Fleet talking about logistics forward to include repair forward, uh, much as we did in World War II. You know, there were some major shifts we had to bring back when, when uh, uh, the New Orleans had her uh, bow, bow blown off um, in the Solomon Island campaigns adjacent to uh, the Guadalcanal uh, fight. Um, her initial repairs were done there in the islands. She then went back to Australia um, to have a, a stub bow put on and steamed her all the way back to uh, Bremerton to have the bow fixed. And then she steamed to Hawaii and was refitted there. So, you know, I'm not saying that we won't have to do those things in the future, but it's going to be very difficult to main, maintain the, nascent, the necessary cadence of the war fight unless we really operationalize logistics and make sure people understand logistics is much more than just uh, beans and bullets. Um, a couple, one, uh, just a couple uh, more points. One is it's very easy to judge because it's uh, so hard to understand. And Jeff alluded to this, that you know, this, the book is somewhat controversial, but Jeff will have to have a sidebar about what's controversial about it. There may be some people that don't understand it. And because they don't understand it, human nature is to criticize things it's another pitch to read the book it's a dense book you know that that may not jeff and tony may not appreciate me saying that they may scare some readers away but war fighting is dense especially in the maritime domain so if you're if you're a maritime war fighting professional you owe it to yourself to not only read this book but study it deeply understand it because without that foundation it's going to be very difficult for you to make that transition from the tactical side of war fighting to the operational uh, side uh, of war fighting. I see alignment between strike, scout, screen, and base and ex being expeditionary or being mobile. Um, I think we've got to be asymmetric in our approach with a peer fight because we don't have the benefit of interior lines. All of our lines are exterior from a logistics perspective, and almost all of our adversary lines are interior lines. They are always going to have the advantage of force, deeper magazines. Um, so this book speaks to that challenge first from a mathematical perspective. So we understand what do we need to do on the art side. And I actually wrote this at, at the end of my comments. And interesting that that uh, uh, that Jeff brought this up. Um, I hear this. I just was in D.C. for two days and had a big discussion. Of course, everybody talks about how technology is going to make everything great hypersonics and all the rest of that stuff. I'm a big believer in hypersonics, don't get me wrong. Um, but uh, technology, if it's an enabler, it's an enabler it, to solutions. And those solutions are not the technology themselves. You've got to understand the math. You've got to understand the science, figure out where your gaps are. And then based on those gaps, you know what technologies you should be pursuing to close those gaps. I've told this story many times and I'll close on this point. Um, many times I someone would come in and give me a brief as the PAC fleet commander with some widget. They would say, this is gonna rock your world. And I'd put my hand on the brief and say, tell me about my world. And the conversation would end. That's not their problem, that's my problem. We don't communicate enough those, well now I'm not in uniform anymore, but when I was in uniform, we didn't communicate enough to those that were uh, experts in, in bringing uh, technology and other potential uh, enablers to the fleet and allowing them to understand the context of what our gaps and seams are. This book, and I hope this, this discussion that you're about to engage in, um, will help pull the curtain back on that uncertainty uh, by pursuing a scientific approach, a mathematical approach to more deeply understanding a significant portion of this, this war fight um, which is much more understandable than than we choose to treat it at this point. Um, so this isn't about me. This is about the book. This is about uh, Jeff and Tony's perspective and about the audience. So George, let me turn it back over to you. Uh, uh, thanks, Admiral. And, and really, Jeff, Tony, uh, Admiral, thank you for your remarks. A terrific discussion. I mean, the, the book itself, to me, has kind of a tactical feel to it, but application uh, at the operational and strategic levels of war. But as I try to think back when I was a young lieutenant, what references, what books did I have to kind of reflect on, you know, to be a young warfighter trying to learn my service warfare skills and how to fight at, at, at sea 
uh, as compared to, you know, as I got more senior, as Admiral Swift uh, suggests, as you get more senior in rank, you know, how does that compare to the operational level and to the strategic level? So I applaud you for really packaging all that up in, um, in, your, in your book. So thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I see uh, questions already, so we're going to get right after it. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left uh, for questions. Uh, so with that said, uh, I'll just look, go right down in the order from Victor Sussman. Uh, if basing is the linchpin for providing sustained combat power, how can it best support a more numerous flotilla fleet? And how can greater attention to a service, service force be factored into force structure discussions? Um, Jeff or Tony, you want to tackle that question? Uh, Jeff, I'll take that one if you don't mind. Um, it's a great question and, and one of my favorite soapboxes. Uh, just one uh, back up in just a little bit. When we talk about base and basing, we're talking about all of the support and sustainment and logistics uh, resources available to the fleet commander. So that includes combat search and rescue. It includes salvage, it includes replenishment at sea, it includes repair facilities or assets, um, everything that allows a fleet commander to regenerate or sustain the fleet. Uh, so the answer to the first, the first question, how can it best support a more numerous uh, flotilla fleet is really answered by your second one. We, we need more emphasis on the service force. Um, we have insufficient uh, service craft, uh, both for replenishment at sea, uh, repair, et cetera. So if you think about, let's say, a major seven fleet fleet engagement in the West Philippine Sea, and let's assume for a minute that none of our ships have been sunk, so we don't have to worry about combat SAR, and none of them have been damaged, so we don't have to worry about towing an aircraft carrier um, somewhere to be repaired. Uh, and we can re rearm the aircraft carriers by replenishment at sea. But one of the limitations we have is the inability to rearm uh, vertical launch systems at sea. And most of the escorts, you can assume, are going to be greatly deplenished in their number one combat system. And where is the nearest place they have to go to get rearmed from the West Philippine Sea? It is a long way. And the fleet commander cannot employ the strike arm of his carrier force until he gets those escorts rearmed, she, he or she, uh, gets those escorts rearmed. Um, so you can see that there's a huge cycle time that's been added there to uh, regenerate combat power um, because of one combat system. But uh, I also worry a, a lot about uh, uh, combat SAR and salvage uh, we don't have destroyer tenders anymore. We don't have repair ships anymore. We don't have the mobile uh, repair bases like we had in the um, in World War II, where we could turn an, a protected atoll into a shipyard. Uh, we just don't have those kind of capabilities anymore, and I think that's going to hurt. And just to follow up, just slightly on that, uh, Tony. Um, a good reference uh, to see what kind of Herculean efforts you need. Um, to, to, to satisfy the level of logistics we're talking about. Uh, you can go back and read uh, Beans, Bullets, and Black Oil uh, that was written right after World War II. Um, that, and actually, before World War II, we actually talked about a base force. It was its own force that, that did the basing um, and, and transport of Marines was in that base force. Um, but we had to create all these, uh, a modern combat logistics force um, because we did not have one um, uh, that was sufficient for the scale of operations we needed. And, and that's a, a good cautionary tale for current investments. We've uh, recently been talking more about a combat logistics force, but for a long time, Military Sealift Command was a commercial type provider. Um, and back in the Cold War, when we worried about fighting uh, the other kind of bear, um, we had a combat logistics force manned by Navy personnel that was meant to go in harm's way as part of the fleet train. And in some ways we've lost that great capability uh, to include all the tenders that we had, to include all the ammunition ships that were right there with the, the battle force. Um, that's not something that you can recreate overnight. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Admiral Swift, uh, former Pacific Fleet Commander, anything to add to, to that discussion? I would, 
Yeah, I would just briefly say that uh, the terms are familiar um, to the basing question, uh, but but the so just because we we're using the same terms that have been in the past, I think the book is useful in going back and uh, using those terms in a broader context. You know, if, if if you've got a problem you don't understand, come up with a new word for it. You know, if you, if you look at that slide of Jeff, you've got all these these joint uh, terms down one side and only four on the other side. So whether it's truly Einstein that said it or not, everything should be as simple as possible and no simpler. So this is this is not a simple problem. Um, basing is much more is much broader in the true context of of naval warfare um, than we traditionally think of it today. Uh, excellent. Thank you. So the next question from John Hooper. Um, are the premises of the book um, being reviewed or have they been reviewed or are they now and are they now being integrated into NWP 5.0 or tested in our naval war games or taught at TAO school? Uh, Tony, I'll take that one. I am meeting with the Maritime Advanced Warfare School folks uh, early next week to have that exact conversation about how it relates to what's already being taught at, uh, at, at that school at, at the War College. Uh, I will say that Tony and I actually taught this as an elective at the War College, and, and it was part of, of, of the effort to making sure we were formulating the ideas in a way that was uh, relevant and applicable and, and digestible by fleet officers was, was to conduct that, that elective. Um, and the book only came out in December, so. We're, we're pedaling as fast as we can, and we, we hope to get those invitations to talk to the right people and get them put into the right places. Uh, there's also been some discussions with the Navy Warfare Development Command. Uh, our doctrine organization um, is, is a little bit unwieldy um, in that it's so large and it takes so long to get some things officially into doctrine. So uh, that's an open question, and, and what remains to be seen is what kind of near-term impact we'll, we'll have by this. Yeah, I can see it have an impact. I mean, I, I taught TAO school for two years, and uh, you know, you, you you have so much of your, your TAO handbook and the and, and case studies and stuff. So it would be kind of nice to be able to turn to a book and say, you know what, you, you have to read this book or make it mandatory reading for the for all the students that there's application here that you ought to take with you back to the fleet, uh, and when whatever position you might. Have. So uh, again. So I may get voted off the island here, George, but can I pipe in again with another comment? Absolutely. So correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff and Tony. I, I think you've just been, it's just been uh, going through a third printing now. Is that right? Uh, closing in on it, we hope. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that shows that shows the interest there. The other thing is, if, if you're not familiar with Wayne Hughes, you will be familiar with him in reading this book. I mean, he jumps off the pages. Uh, but what we're really talking about here in my mind is cultural change. We've got to change the culture to understand. We've got to get away from hand waving. We've got to get back to the science of war fighting as a foundation before we really understand how to apply the operational art of, of war fighting. Um, and that cultural change is hard. There are many out there who have continued to read and be informed by Wayne Hughes's work yeah, um, as well as his writing. And that is, I think, where the core of the audience, the, the book, the folks reading the book and applying it are now. They're instructors out there. Um, but I am, I am encouraged uh, by the number of institutions that are formally reaching out and either have already included it in their curriculum or have a desire to. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And really, uh, John Hooper's next question, too, is in kind of uh, in first application into the fleet X's and the comp two X's and JTF X's. So again, relatively new new document affecting change. I think that hope would be that, yeah, there might be application uh, in real world events. So I'll, I'll go ahead and skip since we're getting a little short on on time now. Uh, I'd like to jump down to Jamie McGrath since John, John had a, a shot already, but uh, for Jamie McGrath, he wrote, how can we use the ideas of scout, screen, strike, base, and translate that to the joint force to allow the joint force to better understand the support of the Navy, Navy fight? Jeff, since you kind of made a point of that, maybe? Yep, I sure will. And actually, I'll go back to uh, what Admiral Swift said. Um, if the Air Force is going to support us with maritime in our maritime operations, you, go, you can go back in history and see 
um, the challenges they had in the Pacific and figuring out how to bomb ships. And actually they ended up being very innovative and, and teaching us a thing or two by developing the skip bomb tactic that was devastating to Japanese shipping during World War II. Um, but this is a, a doc, this uh, in my mind, and having actually lectured at the Air War College uh, before, um, if they want to know how we fight and they want to be part of our fight, um, the joint organization needs to understand how navies fight rather than try to translate navy fight speak into joint speak because it loses so much uh, of the riches. You know, it's there's a reason why um, we have a different language and we call things a ladder and a bulkhead. And, you know, some of it is cultural, but some of it has to do with the, nar the maritime nature of our business. We call things different things for a reason. And those words came around after after a long time of developing them because they were unique things. And we had to invent new words for them so that people would understand uh, the difference between um, the, 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 the seagoing thing that we're doing as opposed to a land, land going thing that, that other people do. So I think they would be definitely informed um, in some of, in, in joint doctrine would be better informed by understanding how navies fight rather than trying to make navies comport with their um, big green army based language. <laughs> George, George if, I, if I could add, yeah. if I could add as well, it's happening at the tactical edge. So Hot Carlisle was one that initiated this as the PAC AF commander. Um, his relief Shags O'Shaughnessy was the PAC AF commander when I came back as PAC fleet. Um, that, and then uh, of course, uh, uh, General Berger was Mar 4 PAC at the time. And if, if you look at EABO, I, I, I'm a big believer in DMO. I just, it's just not cogent and, and organized enough. I think if you took the book and understood the book, then um, DMO would be much more organized and aligned in, in the mindset of how you apply it. And it absolutely meshes in that context, not as it's written now, but in that context, it absolutely meshes with what the Marine Corps is writing with EABO. It's how you organize the force. And I know PACAP is heavily involved in this. You know, they, they can't uh, 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 quote chapter and verse that uh, what scouting, screening, and basing is, but all three of them are critical elements of their own. They're also enablers for strike. And those joint concepts that appear to be the same, you've got difficulty uh, going against a, a defensive or an offensive force, as Jeff pointed out, that can be a thousand miles away from where it was yesterday and a thousand miles further on the next day. This, this isn't a fairly static battlefield that those joint concepts have been developed on. That's, that's not the war fight in, in the maritime uh, domain. Excellent, thank you. Um, one time for maybe one more quick question, a little bit of a research piece, I guess, in, in writing the book. Was there any investigation of the fleet battle problems from 1939 to 1941 that war plan orange execution to the to the premises of this book? <laughs> and Tony's holding something up. So um, I, I won't argue that we uh, have the battle problems sitting at our, our elbow, but we were well familiar with war plan orange uh, development and the strategic development or strategic thought development in the Pacific. Um, the Navy started the premise with the Army's request, hey, you got to be able to relieve us in the Philippines immediately. We know the Philippines are going to be at risk. Uh, you need to get out here real quick and, and, and help us out. And the Navy studied that and war gamed it and looked hard at it. And there was just no way they could get from first the West Coast and then even from Pearl Harbor to the Philippines in force in order to take on uh, the Japanese. Um, and so they, they developed War Plan Orange the way it developed. But they worked that hard uh, in the 20s and 30s. And the distances haven't changed. And the challenges of, of sustaining forces that far forward in combat and then regenerating that combat power are, are, are huge challenges. Uh, we touched on it in the earlier question. I won't belabor it. Um, but it's, but it's a big challenge. Hey, George, I can't, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, no. I'll vote myself <laughs> off the island after this one. So, so go look on Wikipedia at, at Fleet Battle Problem. There was 22 of them in the interwar years and they, they informed O-Plan Orange and O-Plan Orange informed them. 
We restarted those when I was a PAC fleet commander. And the first one that, that we did, we called Fleet Battle Problem 23 because we wanted it to be absolutely connected with the same concept of those interwar battle problems. And we publicized it as, as a deterrent. Now you won't see what Fleet Battle Problem 24, 25, 26 is because those, those are happening uh, you know, not, not in a public context, but it goes back to this book. It's, it's about first understanding the problem, then, uh, then owning the problem. We can't uh, uh, rely on, we can't afford to continue to admire the problem. And it, this book helps us get after this problem of people just saying, we need to go faster. I can go wicked fast in a circle, but we can't afford to anymore. What we need is a vector, a vision, so that we have speed with a vector, which is velocity. We need to increase the velocity of what we're doing to get after this problem set. And that's what Jeff and Tony have provided in this book. Excellent. Thank you again, uh, Jeff, Tony, I'm going swear it was truly a, an honor and a privilege to, to host you this evening to learn more about your work. We congratulate you again on your book and appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedules to, to spend it with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes tonight's lecture. Our next presentation will occur on Wednesday, October 19th. U.S. Naval War College Professor David, David Conan will uh, offer remarks regarding a visit of the German submarine U-53 to the Naval War College in October of 1916. Updates to this presentation and others, including our end of year Sentinel of the Sea Award Gala on Friday, November 4th in New York City, when we will present the Honorable Jim Mattis, General United States Marine Corps retired with the foundation's highest award, are posted on our webpage at the Naval War College at Naval War College Foundation.org slash our dash events. Um, thank you again for turning in tuning in tonight and for your continued support for the national security missions of the Naval War College and the Naval War College Foundation. As always, we seek to expand our membership and raise awareness of the great institution which is the Naval War College. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you've already if you're already a valued Naval War College uh, Foundation member or know others who might like to learn more about the Naval War College and the foundation, please consider them a giving them a tax deductible gift of membership so that they too can stay abreast of key issues affecting our national security and democratic way of, not, of, way of life. You can contact my staff directly for assistance or simply visit our website and select membership. Thank you again and have a great rest of your evening.